Hi everyone, good morning. I work with Property Claims Consulting. We help people recover after losses. We work with the insurance companies to try to get you the best settlement. But you know what? We can help replace your property. Nothing can help replace life. So please visit the vendors, listen to Mr. Norcross when he speaks, be safe, be safe. Pay attention to the information here because it could save your life. The name of the game, ladies and gentlemen, is preparedness. It's awesome that you come and you attend these events and you get your little baggies with all the goodies in it. Broward County, as well as the city of Daniel Beach, if something happens, they're, they're gonna do their part. We also need you to do your part to make sure that you get all the information and the tools and resources that are needed so that you can make sure that yourself, your homes, and your families are prepared for any event, any event that a mandatory evacuation is issued, ladies and gentlemen, please, please, please leave. The number one, the number one thing that takes people's lives during a, during a hurricane is the storm surge. All of that water, you can't run from it. So if you hear that evacuation order, pick up your emergency disaster kit, grab the kids and the pets, and go, okay? Head to uh, your evacuation zone or the evacuation shelter for your designated area. I cannot stress that enough. FEMA.gov has a wealth of information that you can go on and learn about all the different disasters, the things that you can do before, during, and after a disaster. We cannot prepare if we don't know what we're preparing for. Right now, today, we are in hurricane season. Hurricane season runs from June 1st, November 30th, every single year. It doesn't change. But that is only the time that hurricanes are most likely to hit us. Last year, our first named storm was January. So storms can hit any time, but they're most likely during hurricane season. Please always be prepared for hurricane season because it does just take one. And unfortunately for us, we don't know which one it's gonna be. Please make sure you have a family plan. In Broward County, our evacuation zone is east of Federal Highway. For 10 steps for to make a family plan, you can go to the Broward.org uh, slash hurricane website, to the FEMA website, to the State Division of Emergency Management web website. Make a family plan. It's very important while we're in blue skies, while there's nothing out there threatening us, to know what you're going to do with your family. Please look at the supply list. Make sure you have the proper supplies, which is a, it's just one gallon of water per person per day for up to three days. Um, the, other, the things that aren't on the list, make sure you have cash, because ATMs might not be working. If the banks are closed, they're not going to take it on your good looks or your pretty smile that you have money in, the, in that account. If they can't look at their computer and verify you have money in your account, that you can't get it. So have cash. And the one thing everybody always laughs at me about is before a storm, do your laundry. And I know that sounds ridiculous. But a lot of times when we have a storm, the water gets tainted. I'm not washing my unmentionables in, in tainted water. So you probably don't want it either. And if you wash your laundry before a storm comes, you'll at least be starting with everything clean from the, from the get-go. So it makes it a little easier. Um, in the county, we do have a, a, our shelters. Julia talked to you about our general population shelters. We also have a special medical needs shelter, and you know, it's for people that need more medical assistance. Uh, if you call the, the county call center, 311 or 954-831-4000, they can get you if you feel you're in a special medical need, you should go to a special medical needs shelter. Uh, they can send you the registration form and have you triaged. We do suggest you do that prior to going.
to, you know, prior, prior to a storm coming. Um, we also have the Humane Society who does our pet friendly shelter. And you guys, since you are in an evacuation zone, you are the people that it's really there for. And if they have extra room, they'll take people. But if you're in a hurricane evacuation zone and you plan on evacuating with your pets to a shelter, pre-register with them before the storm. Don't wait until the storm. Because while you're waiting to the last minute to do it, we're trying to get everything together to do what we have to do to protect you and to do what we need to do before, during, and after. So it's important to pre-register for those things. a photograph of you with your animal. Should your animal get lost and you need to find that animal, you will have, am I okay? You will have confirmation that that's your pet. So that's important. Uh, now, you should also have leashes and collars and ID tags and all those things that you normally should be having on your dog, plus the proof of vaccines. And extra newspapers if you have a cat, and extra cat litter, the normal things that you do every day with your animal. Now, if you stay, if you do not have to be evacuated, you need to follow the normal routine, because this is a frightening thing for a pet. Also, you need to find a place that you can put your pet far away from a window. For instance, maybe a bathroom or a bedroom not near a window and have something there, his favorite toy, uh, some soft music, because this is a frightening thing for many, many pets. Now, if you have to evacuate, you, uh, first off, it would be nice if you could find a relative or a friend that isn't in the evacuation area that you could say, ah, oh, can we come and visit? Can I stay with you? <laughs> so this is always a good opportunity. Plus, you need to prepare if you have to uh, go elsewhere with your pet, that you need to find out what hotels do provide these services and will allow pets. And you need to have those phone numbers on hand so that if you do have to evacuate, you have you can call right away because those places can fill quite quickly. The other thing is that uh, you need to um, also, if you have to evacuate and you have to go to a shelter, there is only one shelter in Broward County and that is at Millennium Middle School and you also have to pre-register for that. <clears throat> When you pre-register, you can do that at the Humane Society of Broward County any day of the week, Monday through Friday, from 9 to 5. You have to bring all the information plus a picture of your pet, which you will leave there. If you are at a shelter, you will not be sleeping with your animal. You will not be next to your... The animals will be in a different area and they will be in cages but you will be assigned a time when you can go and walk your animal, you can feed your animal, give it medication whatsoever. Today I'm going to talk about water conservation. Why is conservation important year round? Um, well first of all, Broward County has high economic growth. Um, we are the 18th most populous county in the country. Um, we have over 1.8 million people. So as our economy grows, so does the demand on our uh, natural resources. And um, our, our water is not infinite. You know, we don't have it forever. Um, and it, only 1% of the entire world's water is actually drinkable. So potable, potable water or drinkable water is really important for us to conserve. We also have a unique natural filtration system. We get our water from the Biscayne Aquifer. Um, which is underneath the ground and basically it's a limestone that holds our fresh water. Um, and what happens is if we let that water table go too low, salt water can come in and that's called salt water intrusion. And what happens sometimes is we have to shut down well fields completely, meaning the, the places that we get our water from. So if we keep that full of water, it's going to save us money in the long run. And of course, you know, the simple laws of economics, when um, the use of water increases, so does the uh, cost. 
why do you want to conserve before, during, and after a storm? Well, first of all, storms are a, a strain on our natural systems, and they're also a strain on our infrastructure. Okay, so if we're making our infrastructure work as it's already strained, um, it's, it's just going to cause more problems. Um, sanitary sewer systems can become strained during and after storms and hurricanes, like I just said. Um, and because of the flood and loss of electrical power, sometimes um, there can be sewage overflow, sometimes our water can be contaminated. Um, so we really need to make sure that we're using as little as possible. Um, if people reduce their water use, it would help the sewage systems and um, basically the, the strain on our systems will uh, reduce. Um, also, we don't know what's going to happen after a hurricane as far as those pumping stations go. Um, so we need to make sure, okay, everything's ready, everything's set, we have enough water to drink because that's how we survive. Um, also, you know, we talked about the, uh, the aquifer. Basically, we have that storm surge come in. That's going to be salt water coming in. If our aquifers are already full of fresh water, that's going to reduce the likelihood of salt water intrusion. So what can we do? Before a storm, conserve as much as possible. Um, you know, we want to be prepared. You want to have at least one gallon of water per day per person for three days. You can fill the bathtub with water. Um, we can also fill reusable bottles with tap or filtered water. Um, so after, what can happen, uh, what we can do to conserve is limit the amount of uh, flushing for our toilets. Um, and the reason for that is the toilet actually uses the most water within the home. So if it's yellow, let it mellow sort of thing. <clears throat> um, take short shower showers and boil water if you need to because like I said, sometimes your water can become contaminated. So what happens if there, you know, we think that there's a storm, we're all prepared, we have all this water, what do we do? We have our bathtub full, are we just gonna let it go down the drain? No, we're gonna go ahead and use that water to uh, water the pets or to water our plants so that we're reusing and we're not just wasting that water. Because oftentimes we, we, we're prepared and we think this storm is gonna be big and then it's not quite as big. So if we don't use that water, we wanna make sure that we, uh, you know, use it for our plants and it's not just going down the drain. What can you do now? The conservation pays program is a toilet rebate program um, and what we do is we offer $100 rebates back for replacing old toilets with new ones and the reason for that like I said earlier is the toilet uses the most water within the home um, so that's the easiest way you can conserve um, people report saving about five dollars per month per toilet um, when they replace them um, for uh, commercial kitchens we offer pre rinse spray valves so this is for like a restaurant those are completely free and they're gonna save water and they're also also going to save energy. And she's got accessories, right? She's got an accessory bag, the princess look. I mean, come on now. <laughs> Remember to prepare to hurricanes, okay? Be safe. We are a law firm located in Hollywood that provides service to the entire state of Florida. We are your home plane professionals. We help you when the insurance company won't. We help homeowners who have either underpaid or denied claims get their money from the insurance company. If anything happens to your home, as you know hurricane season is upon us, Make sure that you get great pictures right now while your home is not damaged so that you have pictures before the loss. Make sure that you take any pictures during the loss. If there's any water or flooding, make sure you take pictures of the outside to show that there was water and flood. Do you guys all know we are in the Everglades. The water will run away very quickly. So we need to have proof. Take pictures and give us a call if you, uh, if you need our help. Please make sure you're prepared for moving into a shelter if you need to. There's special needs shelters in the county as well that you need to register for. We have the shelter maps and a lot of information on what you'll need for sheltering and for making an emergency preparedness kit. If you have a blue ticket from All Pro, I am going to draw for the TV. And here we go. 417. One, three, zero. Hey. Hey. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much to All Pro for being here today and having the awesome raffle prize.
do a lot of planning related to sustainability. Um, our, all of our facilities are hardened, so we do not evacuate a facility. Uh, we do not close a facility uh, because of a hurricane. So it's, it's good that you know that we stay open. Uh, we do shut our doors. I'll talk about that a little bit, just for safety reasons, uh, when a storm hits. But it's important that we are there, um, that we maintain patient care continuity uh, during a storm and that we're available um, immediately after a storm for potential storm surge. We have hundreds of true hardline telephones within our Memorial Healthcare system so that we could communicate between our, health, our hospitals, but we can also communicate to the, to the public. We can receive calls from the public and we can publish those telephone numbers to the public so they know that they can call the hospital if they, if they need to. In addition to telephones, we have multiple types of different two-way radios that we use, both for internal operations as well as communicating to um, outside agencies like the Emergency Operations Center at the county, as well as the um, uh, Department of Health. Communications is very important during a disaster. We know what supplies that we need inside the hospital, from medical supplies to medication, to water, to simple things like toilet paper and paper towels and food and all of these different things that you need to maintain a hospital operation. We work with our vendors. We pay for all those supplies up front. They're stored at a warehouse. Those, 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 um, that inventory is rotated regularly to make sure we don't get any outdated supplies. And so when we get a hurricane watch, one of the first things we do is call those vendors and say, bring those supplies. And those all get delivered to the hospitals. What that allows us to do is maintain operations for at least seven days without any help from the local government or our vendors. The local government, they're going to be busy helping the residents. They're going to be doing rescue operations. They're going to be doing shelter operations. We don't want to burden them with um, meeting our needs as well. So we try to be as self-sustainable as possible. The other thing is, is we have to keep the lights on. So we just heard a presentation about power. You guys will be happy to know that if the power is out all over, Memorial Hospitals will be a beacon of light. <laughs> we have more than one generator at every facility. As a matter of fact, our regional facility has generates enough power to power about four to nine thousand residential homes, and, and that's which is more than even what we need. We keep fifty-six thousand gallons of fuel on site at all times. Plus, we can run on natural gas. So when you combine all that, we can actually run our hospital at seventy percent low, which will run all of our operations for 186 hours. So if the power's off, we can run without refueling for 186 hours. That's amazing. That's more than seven days. Finally, I want to let you guys know, if we have all these operations, we have to have staff. We have to have people in the building. Well, it's hard to get staff in your building after the storm hits. Flooding, blocked roads, whatever the case might be. What we do is we actually pay our staff to come in ahead of the storm. Finally, I want to touch on our patient care uh, operations related to hurricane preparedness. Obviously, we work really hard to make sure that the patients that have to stay with us are safe. Okay, that's why we do all of those other things that I just mentioned. We really take care of our, our, our patients, and like I said before, we want to maintain that level of care just as if there wasn't a hurricane out there. Okay, that's what we strive to do. But what we also do is we work with our local Department of Health, the Broward County Department of Health. You've heard about special needs shelters today. Well, one of the things that we do, and a lot of people don't know this, is that if a person needs a special needs shelter, or, I'm sorry, if they have a condition that is a, requires a higher level of care than what a special needs shelter can provide them, we open up our doors to those individuals and allow them to come into our hospital they have to bring a caregiver and, and other supplies just like they're expected to with a shelter. But we actually give them a place to, to, to ride out the storm. This is done just in case they, they were to encounter a, a decline in their health or they had a, a medical emergency uh, related to their condition. We can immediately treat them right there. They're already in a facility where they can get care where they may not be able to do that in a special needs shelter because they don't have that level of care there or they definitely wouldn't be able to do it at their home. Um, so, and then also, we invite our uh, pregnant ladies that are either high risk or that are several weeks within uh, delivery at the time of the storm. We work with our uh, OBGYN providers and get the information out, and they're welcome to come in and shelter in our hospitals as well. 
just in case they were to go into labor, they were have a complication, they're there, ready to receive help, um, you know, even if that were to happen during a storm. We strive to be here to treat the needs of this community anytime, whether it's a blue sky event or whether it's a natural disaster. Anthony, he's attending Wushu team for almost three years. We started with the summer camp and he started doing so well. So the coach said, let's go ahead and do on a full-time basis. So we attend school for three days a week, practice three hours almost, um, went on a couple competitions and he did very well. And then his older sister, Tatiana, decided to join the team and now she's uh, she is with the Wushu team as well. And um, outside, the team is wonderful and it feels like a family. They spend time together um, going to the beach and playing games. So I'm very happy that something like that exists in our city. Before every performance and competition, um, we get really nervous. Um, but what I try to do is I try like to calm myself. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, when it does work, I give my best in my performance and I try showing what I work for the whole entire year. I was only present for one um, hurricane and it was Hurricane Matthew last year. And my family, we were worried that it would hit um, us and so we got prepared with water, um, a lot of batteries and, um, and uh, food, like, but not like uh, refrigerated food. It's always my pleasure to be in Dania, the, the oldest city in Broward County. And, you know, uh, I, the way I got involved with hurricanes uh, was not the way most people that do what I do got involved with hurricanes. Because almost everybody that, that works the Weather Channel that is interested in hurricanes or that I've ever worked with over the years, you know, had some hurricane hit when they were a kid. And then they got all <clears throat> jazzed about hurricanes and ended up studying it and making it their, their life's work. I got uh, involved with hurricanes. I studied meteorology, but not especially hurricanes, um, although I did take a, a tropical uh, course at, at Florida State. But the way I got involved was in the 1980s, I was working for Channel 10, and I did a segment called Neighborhood Weather. And a lot of those segments were about the history of South Florida. And so if you study the history of South Florida, you study hurricanes. And it occurred to me at that time that if, if, uh, if I were ever chief meteorologist, which I wasn't at that time, which I became in 1990 when I went to work at WTVJ, if I were ever chief meteorologist uh, and one of those big hurricanes of the past came along, everybody was going to be looking at me and saying, uh, you know, what do we do about this? You know, what's the story? What's going to happen? And all of that. So that was how I got involved in hurricanes. And when I went to WTVJ, 
Uh, the management there agreed that we should really study the problem. We did a lot of work on it, two and a half years worth of studying it, more than any TV station ever in history had done. And then we had this hellacious hurricane, Hurricane Andrew. So uh, a lot of my understanding of hurricanes and a lot of what I was able to do when it happened was related to understanding what had happened before. And, and I want to go back to a question that, uh, a very pertinent question that was asked out there uh, earlier. Uh, and that was the question of, of how many of you have ever been through a major hurricane? And most people raised their hand and said Hurricane Wilma, right? Well, major is a funny word because Wilma certainly was a major hurricane event. But major actually means category three and above, and, and I don't use that word because it's confusing, but that's what the technical definition of a major hurricane is, category three and above. So if I say, how many of you have ever been through a category three or above hurricane here in Dania Beach? What's the answer? Nobody. Unless you were here in 1950, that was the last one, right? And the one before that, I don't know, in Dania Beach here, maybe 1947. Maybe. Uh, so you have to go back that far before you get a category three and above. So most of what you experienced in Hurricane Wilma was a category one. It was a high-end category one, but it was a category one. Most of what you experienced, uh, well, all of what you experienced at Katrina was a low-end category one in 2005. So the point is that any hurricane that you think you've experienced is a low-end hurricane event in terms of of uh, what hurricanes can do here in South Florida, and uh, uh, you know, not to mention Hurricane Andrew that, that we're going to talk about today. So it's really important to understand the hurricane history. We have been spectacularly fortunate in our adult lifetimes that we haven't had to deal with this very much. It's been incredibly calm. In, in the United States in general, it's been a relatively disaster-free 50 years. If you just think about it, we haven't had any massive earthquakes that destroyed cities. We haven't had big hurricanes uh, that uh, destroyed cities. Now, Katrina, you might say, but that was an engineering disaster, not a hurricane disaster that destroyed New Orleans. Now, Katrina did horrible things in Mississippi, and other storms have been really, really bad in suburban areas, including Andrew, didn't hit downtown Miami. But we, so we've been spectacularly lucky. But if you go back to the 1940s, 1945, a Category 4 hurricane hit Dade County. 1947, a Category 4 hurricane hit Broward. Hit North Broward, went right through uh, Pompano Beach today. That was the core of it. But it affected Miami significantly. It was a big storm. It affected all of Palm Beach County, all of Broward County, and even into Dade County. 1948, a Category 3 hurricane hit over on the West Coast, kind of like uh, Wilma, and came across. And then another one came across that year. In fact, in 47, there were two as well the Category 4 and a Category 1. In 49, a Category 4 hit Palm Beach County. And in 1950, a Category 4 hit Dade. It was a Category 3 by the time it got to Broward. So just in those years there, it was bing, 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 one after the other. So it can happen. Historically, it can happen. But it hasn't happened. So we have been, you really have to think of us as, as being in this hurricane drought. So using our experience with hurricanes to predict the future is not a good thing. So let me talk about Andrew. Uh, the uh, friends of the library there had this book, um, and, and I just was looking through it. I, I haven't seen it in years. It's a wonderful, wonderful book put out by the Herald. Uh, Andrew, the hurricane that changed everything. And it really is true because it was so extreme and things happened in Hurricane Andrew that, uh, that we didn't even expect would happen. It was so much worse than we thought it would be. There was no reason to think that a storm that strong couldn't happen in this part of the world. It happened in 1935 and, and very, very strong storms have happened here over the years uh, a number of times. But this one was the first modern one so it was measured and observed, and we saw things happen that we didn't, we didn't know. We didn't know the internal workings of hurricanes in many ways until Andrew. And it, of course, it changed the insurance system, and it changed the building code, and it changed emergency management, and it changed so many things. So in many ways, Andrew really is the storm that changed everything. The number one lesson is that the worst does happen. 
You know, storms just don't always jog away from the coast like Hurricane uh, Matthew did last year. They just don't always do that. They don't always weaken when they're coming ashore. As a matter of fact, Hurricane Andrew strengthened as it was coming ashore and continued to strengthen over Southern Dade County. So just because it's coming over land or if, if you live you know, I mean, you folks live near the coast, so it doesn't make any difference. But if people that live in Weston think, oh, it'll be weaker by the time it gets there. Not necessarily. Often, but not necessarily. And it really can be worse than you can imagine. You know, the sort of good thing is Hurricane Andrew happened 25 years ago. We have a lot of evidence of it. I'm going to talk a lot about it. You can learn a lot about it. Uh, and, and the bottom line is if you can understand Hurricane Andrew and be ready for Hurricane Andrew, you can be ready for pretty much anything. I mean, it's that extreme an event. The second lesson is the preparation works. What you do ahead of the storm has so much to do with what happens afterward. So it's, it's uh, you know, if you're going to live in this climate, in this environment, it's just, uh, it's everything. And the idea is to imagine everything. What can go wrong? You know, one of the things that can go wrong very, very easily is your car can get wrecked and you don't have any transportation, and it's not easy to get transportation after a hurricane. So thinking out just the very simple thing of where am I going to park my car is a, is a, a very important thing. Uh, and I can't tell you how many thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of cars were ruined in South Dade and people were stranded. It's a horrible thing to be stranded after a hurricane. So, so just the idea is look around your house, your environment, wherever you live, and just imagine everything and try and think, think it out. Just thinking it out. So number one thing is uh, for preparation is to really think it through. Like I said, really think it out. What am I going to do? What am I going to do if this is a threat? What am I going to do if it's, if it's really coming? You know, what, what am I going to do? That's the, the question. Because these are the things that you, you don't ever want to have happen to you. You don't want to have the inability to escape. You know, you don't want to get trapped in your neighborhood. So high rises, for example, I mean, you don't have a lot of that here, but uh, maybe some of you folks uh, live in, in high rises. High rises, modern high rises now, modern high rises built in the last 20 years are safe buildings. They're very, very safe buildings, as are houses built in the last 20 years. Very, very safe buildings. But in a high rise, you would still want to stay in an interior hallway on the second or third floor. That would be the safest place in the high rise. But you could get stranded in your high rise. What happens if the ocean comes in and, and uh, the streets are impassable, no ambulances, no police can come get you? So that's why they evacuate the beach areas, is they don't want people stranded on the beach. You can be stranded on the beach for a week or more with no accessibility. So that's why they move people away from the water, because the storm surge comes in with all the debris and sand, and now no rescue vehicles, no nothing can get there. And so the, the idea is to get people away. So you don't want to get trapped or you have the inability to escape. What do you, how are you going to communicate? I mean, you know, that's a big problem now. Everybody's got a cell phone, right? Uh, and um, uh, many, many people, probably most, more than half the people, although I see a lot of older folks in here, and we still have landlines of one kind or the other, a lot of us, but most often they're not real landlines. They go over the cable. They're like the Comcast triple play or something like that. That's not a landline. That's electricity dependent phone service. So the old landlines were not electricity dependent. They worked even when the electricity went out. Those, those don't. So very few people today have landlines and the cell phone system will not work after a hurricane. You might be able to text, but you almost certainly won't be able to call. So that's how you're going to communicate and, and uh, who you're going to text and and let them communicate and work all that out ahead of time. That's really important. Don't get stuck with the inability to communicate. How are you going to be informed? You know, my kids, neither of them have transistor radios. The young people don't have transistor radios. A lot of people don't have transistor radios anymore. That is, that is really the only way to be informed after a storm. There is no other way. Because if the phone doesn't work, what are you going to do? How are you, how are you going to... Be informed, know what's going on. A transistor radio is it. And they, you know, they cost. They, they cost less than 10 bucks. And the good thing these days is that flashlights and transistor radios use so much less energy than they did 25 years ago. It doesn't take, you don't have to have a whole garage full or closet full of batteries to keep yourself powered for a week. You can easily uh, keep yourself powered 
uh, with a, a reasonable number of batteries. Uh, LED flashlights run for days and days and days, and lanterns. So you don't have to be without light. You don't have to be without information, but you got to figure it out ahead of time. And how, how are you going to, you know, the inability to take care of yourself. If something happens, you know, your friends and your whoever is going to do it, those are the, those are the things that, that you got to try and solve, is how are you going to not get stuck in one of those uh, kind of situations. So let's just talk for a second about this idea I was mentioning about where it was going. Um, the Wednesday before Hurricane Andrew, I introduced uh, the quasi cone, didn't call it that at the time, but that was the, the beginning of the cone. Our ability to forecast strength is also not good, and certainly not good enough to affect hurricane planning. So we plan for the reasonable worst case. If a storm is coming towards South Florida, storms can rapidly intensify as they approach here. We, we, our plans should always be for essentially worst case storms. If you're farther north, you don't have to think that way exactly. But in Florida, we have to think that way. So our hurricane plans need to be ready for uh, you know, extreme uh, hurricanes. So what's better and worse than, than 1992? Uh, it's really a kind of a trade-off. Because things that are better are government. Government organization, emergency management, is much better than it was. It was chaotic in 1992. The governor couldn't uh, call his office that, and really didn't know between the state and the feds. They didn't know how to even get the disaster uh, process going. That now is well-oiled uh, machinery. Intra-government communications is good. Uh, back then, the fire and the police people couldn't talk to each other. Now, different people all have common frequencies, and they all can talk to each other. New buildings are spectacularly strong. Any building built to the current Miami-Dade building code, which Broward County uses, is, is, a, is a bunker. It's great. You still don't want to stand next to the windows, but, you know, but the building is almost certainly livable after any hurricane that comes along. Be, be awfully unlucky for it to not be livable. Might have damage in a superstorm, but it would be livable. And track forecasts are much better, but they're still not good enough to, to tell you a day in advance exactly uh, where it's going to come. Things that are worse, I think there's too much confidence in the forecast now. Right? People are looking at it and they say, oh, they say it's, it's going to hit Fort Lauderdale. Uh, or they say it's going to hit Miami, so it's OK for us. It, it's, that's nonsense, and, and, but, but you hear that kind of thing on, in the media, and, and the communications is, is not good. And so people have too much confidence in the forecast. People don't have transistor radios. It's a terrible thing. I mean, at the um, History Miami Museum, which I totally recommend you go see the Hurricane Andrew ex exhibit that opened there on Thursday. I was there Thursday night, and all these folks from South Dade, and you know, they all want to talk about we listened on the radio. I don't know what we would have done if you weren't on the radio. If you could imagine being in your closet under a mattress and having no connection to the outside world because your phone is just not working. It's the, what's your, what good your phone going to do? Right? You're not, you don't have any uh, internet connection, whatever. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing to imagine. Hurricane Hugo, the year bef uh, three years before, 89, there were no radio stations or television stations on the air. And those people that went through that just didn't have any idea. People don't have real landlines. There are very few of those left. That you know, I remember being down in South Dade in the yard. Everything in the neighborhood was destroyed. And there was a princess phone sitting there with a dial tone that everybody in the neighborhood used, even though the lines were all laid on the ground, because it was such a robust system and it didn't require electricity. And remember, in South Dade, and in deep South Dade, the power was out for three months. In Kendall, it was out for three weeks or so, three weeks to a month. So the idea of, of things coming back quickly and, and uh, you know, non-resilient systems being workable is not uh, a good idea. Battery TVs don't work. We don't have battery TVs these days because of digital TVs. Now, the next generation of TV system will have them again, but we don't have them now. So that's a, again, a lot of people watched on TV and their little black and white five inch TVs back in 92. That, that, they don't work anymore. And one of the most dangerous things today is that the media is, is much smaller and much less capable. The television, newspaper, radio, uh, 
staffing. It's, uh, I don't know, it's probably 40% of what it was in 1992. What would you have to do to be ready? It, it turns out it's not as hard as it seems. Um, it's very hard to have your life be perfect. <laughs> it's almost impossible to have it be perfect, but to have it have it be a, a speed bump as opposed to a serious, serious life-changing uh, event is not as hard as, as uh, it seems. And the odds, of course, of having a Hurricane Andrew are very low, but if you're ready for something like a Hurricane Andrew, you're ready for anything uh, that comes along. recently experienced a hurricane threat. Here are some tips that we hope will help you prepare better. As you see behind me, there's debris that was placed out around 48 hours before the hurricane. That is not the time to put items out for pickup. These items that are placed out become projectiles and become very dangerous. You see the nails that are on this wood here. This wood at 100 miles an hour could do very much damage to windows, property, so this is not the time to put out these materials. This sofa could wait. You could leave this inside of your home. Don't put it out before a storm. These items can stay inside your house and be safe there rather than to put it out where it's not safe. This metal over 100 miles an hour can do a lot of damage. Cutting your tree right before a storm approaches is not the correct thing to do. It could become very dangerous. You need to trim your trees prior to hurricane season before June 1st. The city of Dania Beach provides monthly bulk schedule pickup. Please check the city's website for your scheduled date. Garbage and recycling services may be interrupted or suspended due to high velocity winds. After a storm, please check our website or listen to code red notifications to find out when services will be reinstated.